Welcome to NDS Property Australia's latest podcast. My name is Min and I'm here with a special guest speaker, Rob Maxwell from Plan for Life Australia. Welcome, Rob. Thanks, Min. Happy to be here. Rob, tell me more about you. What's, uh, what's your story here in Melbourne? I'm the director of Plan for Life Australia. Um, we're a short-term and medium-term accommodation provider for NDIS participants, predominantly looking at country locations such as Albury, Redonga, uh, so that the participants can take anywhere from two days to a week away and a holiday for a short-term accommodation. So we will be helping them with that. Wonderful. Uh, Rob, so tell us more, our audience, more about the uh, the SDA market in Melbourne at the moment with regards to various issues like builder challenges who want to go into um, NDIS or land supply and supply chain issues and and product mixes as well. What's your feedback on the overall on the overall uh, SDA market with all these topics here? In terms of house and land builds, Melbourne is probably a little bit behind Queensland and New South Wales in terms of where they're at with building these type of properties and the builders that are actually involved in the segment. I've been dealing with builders for the last two years and pretty much in every case, the builders start off showing an interest in developing a business in building NDIS properties. They then do the work, but because it's not their core business, they're used to just building traditional houses. This is obviously a lot more complicated, as you and your audience know, in terms of what they have to do and have to get everything assessed and approved. And because of the situation in the world financially, builders obviously are under a little bit of pressure over the last 12 or 18 months. Costs have exploded in terms of uh, builds. They've got supply t- chain issues. They've got staffing issues. The cost of uh, slabs is is increasing uh, enormously. So most of the builders in Melbourne that have looked at this sector have decided over the last 12 months not to pursue it or they've put it on hold. Therefore, there have been very few houses built. Apartments are a little bit different. It's probably a little bit more advanced. Uh, but it is a big opportunity and now a couple of the bigger builders are getting involved in the sector that they're more comfortable that going forward um, it will be profitable for them. Wow, wonderful. So with your background in the construction industry the last few years, how has prices how have prices fluctuated or, or gone up the last year or so since the pandemic began with COVID? With, with the traditional house, Build, I'd say prices in Melbourne would have gone up 20 to 30%, Mm -hmm. predominantly in areas such as the timber frames uh, or steel frames, uh, the concrete slabs, waffle pods, everything is going up significantly in price. So a lot of the builders that have signed fixed price contracts, as they do with with what we're dealing here with the NDIS properties, uh, have got themselves into a little bit of a cash flow squeeze going forward because they've committed to prices that um, now are, are probably another twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars to build. Yeah. But I think they're getting on top of that now and they're more comfortable going forward to be able to offer these products. Is there going to be a much of a easing of the land supply pipeline coming out for the next year or two years? There is a, a decent amount of land available, not necessarily new estates. They're going very quickly. There's still enormous demand for new land. It's selling still really quickly. But there is a lot of land on the secondary markets uh, that you can get in new estates, pretty much all across Melbourne, Geelong, Ballarat region. You're probably looking on average, if you're looking at a new new block in an estate, six to 12 months uh, waiting. But there are options, as I mentioned, for land to uh, access a lot quicker. Yeah, wonderful. So this, just so the audience can, can, can be more aware, this morning, Rob and myself went to a large firm in Melbourne City to talk about the benefits, the pros and cons of considering SDA as a uh, investment option for their property clients. Um, it was good to be, for us to be able to talk to, um, professionals who are in the property and finance game to understand, um, more about the, the NDIS market overall and the SDA, SDA specifically. Um, Rob, what's what's the what's your assessment with regards to the demand or, or, or the categories that are in most sought after by investors at the moment in the Victorian market at the moment? Okay, compared to the rest of Australia, the, there's currently more demand in fully accessible and robust. 
uh, particularly robust. Very few houses being built in that sector and there are a lot of participants now looking for housing that they cannot find. So there's definite demand there, also fully accessible. So we're talking demand, not sup- not delivery or supply, right? That's the demand side, yes. Um, what's being supplied in the marketplace right now? Okay, in terms of uh, what's being supplied, high physical is roughly about 55% of the overall market, in a little bit in Victoria, yep. compared to about 65, 70% Australia-wide, mm. so a little bit lower. Robust is actually fractionally higher, but as I mentioned, the demand's there, hence why uh, it's a good category to look to build. Fully accessible also is up near 20% versus roughly 10% Australia-wide, and improved livability is pretty much similar at about 8% in Victoria compared to Australia. So, Rob... We're from Brisbane and we, we work with a lot of different uh, providers and builders all around, all around Australia. What we've noticed in Melbourne is there seems to be a lot of uh, investors and, and product suppliers in, by way of head lease, lease gar- uh, rent guarantees, head leases, um, you know, the, the 8% on the products out there. It's, it's kind of strange to see that only in Melbourne and nowhere else. Rob, what's your opinion about these these head leases at eight percent? That seems to be a lot of investors being hooked into, and you know, thinking it's the it's the great the greatest thing in the world. What's what's your opinion about that product? Well, builders and developers are offering the eight percent because Victoria may be a little bit more conservative than other other uh, parts of Australia, and an eight percent return is still very attractive in this sector to guarantee tenants. However, as we know. If the investor uh, takes the chance to uh, engage us or find tenants themselves and not sign these head leases, then they're going to end up with a, a better return than that, probably closer to 10%. But there's a little catch there, Rob, and that is these 8% head leases given by SILs and other housing providers in Victoria have a catch. Do you know what the catch is? That it's not guaranteed or? Well, there's no CPI for 20 years. That's okay, the first which one. Is a huge difference. Over 20 years, that's, that's, that's halving your return towards and, the back end. And the other catch is the 8% is only up to a maximum price of 600 grand, even though you spent $900,000 on the purchase price. So it's not 8% on the purchase price, it's 8% to a maximum of 600 grand. Okay, so you're talking 5 to 6% in reality then in Melbourne. You're looking at eight to 900,000 for a house and land package in this sector. So if all you get is 48 grand as a head lease with no CPI on a purchase price of eight, 900 to a million dollars, that's around about 5% yield for a SDA investment. Now, Correct. Very attractive for a builder and a developer, though, therefore. Very profitable business for them. But why would not? Why would it not be attractive to an investor, this 5% return for 20 years at no CPI? Because they can get 10% <laughs> indexed to CPI, which in, in 15 years' time will actually be closer to 20%. Yeah. So it actually is a huge difference when you um, work out the, the figures over time. So to all you all you listeners out there who are uh, blinded by this awesome eight percent head lease, be careful. Watch out for the uh, terms and conditions because it may not be as great uh, when you do the the real numbers. I guess, yeah. So Rob, um, tell us more about supply chain issues with um around the world and with the market, and and will will things get better for the SDA property investors who want to jump into SDA property investment? Well, now that COVID seems to be touch wood improving worldwide, you'd think that the uh, supply chain bottlenecks that have occurred over the last 18 months will gradually ease, maybe not for another three or six months. I think the general view amongst builders is that prices will continue to stay high for that time frame, uh, but maybe we'll have a little bit of easing in six to, to 12 months' time off the pricing, which will make it easier for everybody. Okay, wonderful. Uh, next topic is um, areas around Melbourne or Victoria. I mean, you've been here for how, how, how long have you been living in Melbourne yourself for? My entire life. Your entire life. I won't okay. tell you exactly how long that is, <laughs> but as you know, it's, uh, it's 50 odd years. So what are the hot spots, do you think, 
for demand of STA participants, uh, in your opinion, yep. uh, for Melbourne or Victoria, Melbourne, Victoria, yeah. Yeah, well, there, there, there's a few specific areas that seem to have significant demand and not a lot of supply. The, the southeast of Melbourne, which is a major growth area for all sorts of property, uh, and you're probably looking at about 900,000 to build one of these properties in that area. That's got enormous demand all the way down to Clyde and Berwick and all the way down to Warrigal into um, Gippsland. Uh, that is a definite area for investors to look at. Then on the other side of town, in the mid-northwest, so around your Telemarine, Greenvale and a bit further out, there's also another pocket where there's significant uh, demand for these properties and very little supply there. The west of Melbourne has always got increasing demand because it's such a growth corridor. So there's always going to be plenty of people with disabilities looking for properties around the Wyndham Vale, Werribee, Lara area. And the one that uh, also has got very little supply currently may change, but significant demand is also the Geelong greater area all the way down to Armstrong Creek. So there's probably four or five areas in the in the outskirts of Melbourne where it's affordable, all growth areas where these properties are desirable. So just for the benefit of our listeners on the podcast, do you not think, would an investor think Geelong, Ballarat, Bendigo is a bit too far as an investment property for, NDI, for SDA, do you think? No, well, as you know, with COVID and with the uh, lifestyle changes and people not necessarily going into the office in the city every day of the week, it's actually become a very good investment option full stop and a lifestyle option to live and invest down in Geelong, Ballarat and Bendigo. So I don't see that changing over the next few years and I, I think a lot of people with disabilities are quite happy to live you know, down in Geelong near the beach. So what are the population figures for Geelong, Ballarat, Bendigo per se? I think uh, Ballarat's probably got about 150, 100 to 150,000 people, but it's growing mm -hmm. enormously. The, the new estate's going up in Ballarat and it's expanding rapidly. Uh, Geelong itself, there's probably about 250,000 people and the growth in Geelong is happening in the, in the corridor between Geelong and Torquay all the way down, eventually that's going to be housing all the way down. Mm. Whereas 10 years ago, it was a half an hour drive to get from Geelong to Torquay and there was no housing. Yep. So that entire corridor is going to become housing. It will have plenty of infrastructure and amenities suitable for people with disabilities. So it's very likely they're going to be very um, interested in living down there where it's a, a slightly more relaxed lifestyle near the beach. Um, have you been seeing much in the last year or so of institutional investors creating apartment complexes or or strata title product uh, in the marketplace as compared to house and land? Or, or should I say, do you, what do you think is more the prevalent products coming out to the marketplace, apartments or houses? I think in Victoria, because Victoria, similar to Sydney or more specifically Melbourne, is a financial capital with big super funds and uh, big developers that the apartment market was the most attractive for them initially. So Victoria actually, and Melbourne specifically, has a high proportion of apartments relative to other types of um, NDIS homes. Uh, so the last two years, that's been the focus in that area. But I think that will change when the demand shifts more towards house and land and maybe townhouses as well. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, Melbourne has got a high proportion of apartments yep. versus other areas of Australia and also more villas and, and duplexes and townhouses but less homes than the rest of Australia. But I think that'll, that imbalance will, will switch back mm. over time. Rob, you mentioned uh, to me the other day one of your friends uh, works for a seal provider. Yes. And he gets a lot of inquiries himself in his role as operations manager with regards to participants with robust categories as well. Uh, what has he told you about the demand of robust participants, as an example, to his to their company that they, they operate? He's currently got 30 participants waiting for a home. They can't currently get one. And he 
would be able to um, provide, have another two to three participants per week that are contacting him looking for a home. So there's 150 to 200 people in the next 12 months minimum that can't find housing in this sector in the robust homes that need it. Can you explain what a robust home is and what kind of participants it, it's designed to house? Robust homes are designed for participants that have um, mental challenges of some degree. So they might be reformed alcoholics, they might have a, a drug problem, they might have a, a viol domestic violence problem in their history because of, of mental issues. Therefore, the homes themselves need to be built to a, to a higher level to withstand any potential issues with, with physical uh, violence or, for instance, they might want to punch a wall or, or, or hit a wall. They also, because it's, they're, they're very um, sensitive to light and uh, sensory issues and also sound, these homes need to have a level of soundproofing and um, the lighting needs to be uh, done in a way that it makes it a more peaceful environment. And they also have to have provisions for the carers to be able to easily leave the property if there's a problem. So they're, they're just a higher level of build in terms of the structure that needs to be a lot more solid than a traditional home with soundproofing and also uh, they've got to minimise the ability for self-harm within the home. Is, I think there seems to be a lot of misunderstanding in the marketplace from investors about the robust category. Uh, you mentioned that there is high demand and there's minimal, minimal supply. I mean, how much supply is there in the marketplace of SDA at the moment in Victoria specifically? There's very little in the robust, roughly 10% of the properties well below the demand. Uh, now the issue that investors have probably had and why they've shied away is, is for the potential for damage to their properties that could cause um, financial loss. But there's a very wide spectrum of participants that are in the robust category. A lot are perfectly fine, uh, reformed alcoholics, reformed drug addicts, or have come from a family that have had those issues that are just looking to have companions to talk to and, and go for a walk with that are, are not violent at all. You can get the extreme that potentially do have violence, but you do have the ability to screen potential tenants, particularly with the situation at the minute where there's a lot of demand and very little supply. So you can be a little bit more choosy with the type of tenant that you're uh, comfortable with. Just to show how much funding goes towards a robust participant. What is the amount, the range of amount the government funds for SIL funding for a robust participant? Yeah, this actually shocked me when I um, saw the figures and, and was told, but currently it's it's roughly $1 million to $1.5 million per year of funding per participant. And some of them have got funding for two carers at once. Um so it's a, it's a lot of money. Two, it's still cheap relative to what it would cost to, to um, house these people in hospitals and nursing homes. Is that two carers twenty four seven? Can be depending on the on the the level of the mm. the robust participants' um, disability. Wasn't there a year ago? You, you, you told me a story about a young, well, a a participant in robust category who needed five carers. It was, it was, it was a very extreme scenario a long time ago. You told me about that. Uh, that that's quite possible. Yeah, yeah. I can't remember the specific case, but that that could be possible, yeah. and that might be at the extreme end. Yep, from a violence violence and potential uh, issue there. Mm. It must be pointed out that the robust category design home does also cater for improved livability participants, right? Yes, yes. Pretty much everything, bar um, high physical support and fully accessible. So based on that. What is the participants seeking SDA as per robust versus improvability then? Improved livability overall Australia-wide, as as you're aware and I've mentioned in your other podcasts, it's roughly about 70% of the entire participants requiring NDIS homes. And there's currently 
uh, not over 900 in the improved livability category who are, versus, seeking, yeah. who are seeking housing versus under 200 for robust. So it's four or five times as many. Yep. So there's plenty of demand for improved livability as, as an option as well. We often tell our clients just because you have or you decide thinking about building a robust designed home doesn't mean you have to have robust participants. It is. No. You could easily put two or three improved livability participants in the home. The rental would be slightly less mm -hmm. but still very attractive. You're still looking at 8, 9, 10, 11, 12% per annum. Exactly. And even if you didn't want, if you know, if you did not even want to have a SDA participant in the house, you could easily rent it out to a normal, normal mum and dad family. Correct. As a, a last resort, you can always rent it out to a normal family or even an elderly couple that might have medical issues with walking around with hip replacements that are more than happy to have the, the ramps and everything in the housing. It actually is, is attractive for them as well. So therefore it begs the question, would a normal family living in a robust home can they tell it is a robust home? Technically not, no. No, because a lot of it's um, unseen. Yeah. Behind the wall. The, behind the wall, yeah. Yeah. And soundproofing is good for yes. any any family. Mm. We all like double brick and um, gla double glazed windows for soundproofing purposes. Yeah. Because a, a media room of a house essentially is a breakout room or Correct. a sensory room. Yep. Okay, so it's a, essentially a four bedroom, two bathroom, two car with a media media room as a normal house anyway. So the goal of these houses is to is to allow comfort for the participants to live a normal life in the community. Yeah, and you have wider hallways, wider doors, which is attractive for anyone for any home. Mm. Everyone wants a bigger hallway. Exactly. So before we finish up for the for the the podcast today, Rob, what's what's the long term view of Victoria in the overall SDA Australia market? I think it's a very good opportunity for investors to build these homes, at least for the next five or 10 years. We can never be sure what's going to happen after that. But of all the areas in, in Australia, uh, I think it's a very good opportunity. And now we've got builders that are comfortable to pursue the sector. It, it, it makes it, um, you know, well worth looking into. We, from, from NDIS Property Australia's point of view as a business, we are very bullish on Victoria and Melbourne. And the reason being is the, the penetration rate of SDA into the market in Melbourne or Victoria, sorry, is only 13%. Uh, and then our opinion is because of the lack of land supply the last few years, the, the builders being so focused on first home buyers. Um, the, the challenges of being a SDA builder itself in Melbourne, um, you know, builders being builders, the path of least resistance is to build a normal house. So obviously the, the, the gap between supply and demand is growing day, by the day. And now that land's coming back to a normality, a normal kind of balance in the Melbourne market, I think we're going to see more opportunities to build SDA homes in Melbourne, no matter what it is, improve their ability or robust or HBS and so forth. But, um, one thing you mentioned this morning at the, the meeting at uh, the office of this other company, you mentioned about the hybrid design home from this one of these big builders, which we won't, we won't mention the name, obviously, but what's so unique about this special hybrid model that we talked about today? This hybrid home it will be able to cater pretty much for all four categories. It's a combined, robust, high physical support approved and assessed category. Therefore, you could have a mixture of any of the four in the home and it's very cost effective. It's only a little bit more expensive than, than a high physical or a robust home. Wow. So it just gives an investor more option to have more participants in the different categories. But surely the cost would be massive to having a hybrid. Surely. No, we're talking $20,000 roughly. And that's all. Wow. Yeah. That is amazing. So when would an investor not choose the hybrid model? If their budget doesn't allow them to spend the extra money, I would <laughs> suggest is probably the, <laughs> the, the extra 20, the extra 20 grand. Yeah, correct. So there's no, there's no reason to, to not do it then. Not really, because you're giving yourself uh, more options down the track for in terms of rental uh, potential. So just so we're clear, we're talking about a fully accessible wheelchair friendly house. That's almost almost uh, also robust friendly as well. So robust, improvability, HPS, fully accessible, 
at the same price effectively. And For an extra twenty thousand dollars, roughly, yes, that's amazing. And I don't think that's available in too many places on the market, if any. And a comparison of this hybrid cost compared to other prices around Australia. Well, we we think at the minute the the prices that we've secured with our builders are actually very competitive. Um, that are significantly lower than other parts of Australia. Now, that may change as supply um, costs increase, but we're, we're more than comfortable with the pricing that we've been given. Mm. I think from an investor's point of view, they're after cash flow and yields. And investors do seek a SDA investment for different reasons. One could be to have a social impact in the community. One is to provide for um, a family member who may be in need of a SDA home. Others could be yields focus only and others could be cash flow only. So I guess this flexible product being a hybrid build is really effective from my investor's point of view long term, I guess, yeah. Yeah, just another option for you all to consider. Wow. Well, we look forward to hearing more about that, Rob, in the coming few weeks uh, as um, as we fly down to Melbourne quite regularly to spend time with developers, builders and um, third parties. We're very excited to launch our business into uh, the Melbourne market with uh, various partners like yourself. And uh, thanks very much for your time, Rob. Talk to you soon. All right. Thanks, Min. Happy to help. And um, let's see what, how we can help your investors. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.